Hello, and thank you to everyone for joining us today for this conversation on achieving a resilient US theater post-pandemic. I'm Barbara Fuchs, here with Rhonda Shara, my research assistant on this project, as well as our panelists, Corinna Schulenberg, Director of Communications and Research for Theater Communications Group, and Greg Reiner, Theater and Musical Theater Director of the Performing Arts Division of the National Endowment for the Arts. We'd like to thank HowlRound for hosting us, with special thanks to Ramona King, VJ Matthew, and Emily Ferris for all your work to make this event happen. We wanted to begin by telling you a little bit about this project, how we came to undertake this research and write this report, and then focus on a few of our key recommendations. Before I forget, and we will post this repeatedly in the chat, on our webpage, you can access our full report, which takes us from conditions leading up to the pandemic, to pandemic responses, to the aftermath in which we are still existing. After our presentation, we will hand things over to our panelists for their responses. And last, but certainly not least, we'll open up the discussion for questions from you, our audience, which you can post to the group chat. So our report on the US is part of Pandemic Preparedness in the Live Performing Arts, a comparative transnational study on the resilience of theater post COVID funded by the British Academy. Between April 2023, about January 2024, a team of researchers from the USA, UK, Canada, Germany, France, Italy, and Japan examined the lessons learned from the responses of the live performing arts sector and governments to COVID-19 in the G7 countries. The aim of the overall study was to support sector preparedness for future crises, whether caused by new pandemics, climate-related disasters, demographic changes, economic pressures, or the impacts on the live performing arts of national and international politics. Of course, the challenges and solutions in each national context are different, but the transnational study offers some sense of the possibilities. So if you want to consult that study, we've posted that link to, uh, to the chat. While the general study was very focused on the pandemic and its aftermath, we found as we began our work that in the US there were many other long-term trends to consider and that we needed to think about those in order to present the whole picture. Um, for the US, we conducted a literature review and held subsequent interviews with stakeholders across the US uh, with a particular focus on California and New York. Uh, given relatively little, little formal research on the sector in the US, we have collected available studies from the government agencies and art service organizations as well as from the SMU Data Arts Program, which is directed by the invaluable Zanny Voss, who has done so much good work in this area. Um, given lags in data collection and publication timelines, much of the research we found covers the period of uh, 2021 and 2022, early pandemic and you know towards some more uh, post shutdown, but still um, ongoing effects period. With less information thus far on how theater makers are faring as the pandemic recedes and the exceptional government support afforded during that period comes to an end. Uh, support which, which had briefly brought the US closer to, but still not on par with the government support for the arts that's enjoyed in other countries, uh, such as those that participated in the wider transnational survey we took part in. Um, to cover the intervening time period up to today, we mostly turn to the fast and furious appearance of articles in newspapers and industry publications Times and American theater, um, chronicling the closures and contractions going on across the country recently, as well as the current conversations about ways to move forward. We also had two lived experience panelists, Jesse Berger of Red Bull Theater in New York and John Rivera of Playwrights Arena here in Los Angeles, as we wanted to hear directly from practitioners what their experience of this period had been. Uh, all of the resulting information uh, went into the report, which you can find at the link. So before we jump in, I really want to take a moment to offer a huge thanks first to Pascal Abisher and Karen Gray, who led the transnational study, our work, as well as to our colleagues across the G7 nations for their inspiring work um, in, in their own research. I also want to thank all the stakeholders who took time to speak with us and whose ongoing work we very much want to recognize in our report. Much of what we're recommending builds and expands on existing work, which we hope to lift and visualize. And again, I want to offer our thanks to HowlRound for being exactly the kind of platform that we need to come together and consider shared solutions. So what did we find? Well, we found an incredibly rich and varied landscape with relatively few spaces for sharing knowledge about it. 
we found a number of companies that were thinking about their place in the local ecosystem in very exciting ways, not just their relation to a community, which many theaters foreground, but to an ecosystem of artists and arts organizations. Companies like Detroit Public Theater or Cannonball in Philadelphia, sharing space and expertise, offering alternatives to the purely transactional, imagining creative ways to make resources go further. We found companies striving to address the urgent calls for racial and social justice that with the murder of George Floyd were also a key part of the pandemic moment. We found art service organizations making powerful arguments for the arts and funders who had bent over backwards to address the challenges of the pandemic. And we found ourselves wishing that there were more ways for the field to find out about them and learn from them through more arts journalism, more research, more thinking as a sector. We found that the pandemic was both a unique cataclysm and that it exacerbated long-term challenges and trends, including crucially an erosion of the subscription system that was decades in the making and an increasing shortfall between ticket income and expenses. Although companies are trying all kinds of creative ways to address the shortfall with a quote, sea change as one uh, article put it in the frequency of co-productions and slighter production schedules, fewer productions is fewer productions with less work for theater makers and a reduced experience of the arts for audiences. Um, there's widespread support in the sector also for improved working conditions, including higher salaries overall to keep up with inflation and make up for financial losses caused by the shutdowns, um, as well as reduced rehearsal times and fewer performances per week to increase work-life balance and support a burnout workforce and a push for reliable full-time employment instead of precarious gig work overall. Um, a major milestone in this conversation about the workforce was the publication of the We See You White American Theater Manifesto in June 2020 by a collection of BIPOC artists who highlighted long-term racial inequities in the industry and called for a new social contract for theater. Research for the report that we did clearly shows that artists from minority backgrounds had already been underrepresented and underfunded for years, which only worsened in the pandemic. Um, however, there is simultaneously recognition that these necessary changes can increase costs for companies who are already facing existentially threatening financial issues. Rising labor costs combined with higher materials costs, general inflation and lagging audience returns all present challenges for theater companies who nonetheless want to do right by their workers. Uh, to that end, conversations in the industry have begun to think about significant overhauls to the financial models of nonprofit theater companies. Um, in our study, we spoke with the arts advocacy group Californians for the Arts who are thinking large scale about labor and employment issues, including worker classification laws, payroll systems, and more things on a state level. Although it remains perhaps the most significant challenge to the sector in the history of US theater, we also found that the pandemic presented a remarkable opportunity in that lobbying worked. What do we mean by this? As the federal government began rolling out programs to address the acute economic crisis, theaters grappled with the complexities of applying for support that had been imagined primarily for businesses. The Performing Arts Alliance, the Coalition of Performing Arts Advocates, worked tirelessly to ensure that nonprofits could apply for the Paycheck Protection Program, or PPP loans, offered by the Small Business Administration, loans that would be forgiven if organizations could prove that they'd been used on payroll costs. The most important legislation to prop up the sector was the Shuttered Venues Operators Grant, operated by the SBA, which offered an unprecedented $16 billion while focusing on businesses rather than artists. Crucially, securing the extension of this urgent legislation to the nonprofit sector and its eventual passage required leaders to come together and pursue specific lobbying. This raises for us the crucial question of whether after the decades long retreat in the aftermath of the culture wars of the 90s, theater and the arts more broadly can now once again effectively make an argument for government support in the wake of the pandemic. In short, we found that the challenges of the theater sector in the US are those of US society more generally. This won't come as a surprise to anyone. Individualism and a dearth of collective endeavor, precarization of workers, decreased investment in the commons, political polarization, social isolation. We thus find it ever more urgent and important for the sector to think and operate as a sector in a shared ecosystem. But this is no easy matter, given how varied that ecosystem is across an enormous national landscape. We also see an opportunity now to make the case for theater in relation to other post-pandemic revitalization efforts, including movements for social and racial justice, mental health, and crucially, the revitalization of urban cores. 
In fact, many state and local arts service organizations, as Rhonda was mentioning, are already making those arguments. The NEA, as I'm sure Greg will expand upon, is actively developing promising partnerships with other government agencies, including Health and Human Services and the Environmental Protection Agency. There have even been calls for reconceptualizing culture as infrastructure in order better to support it. One of our key questions then is how these various efforts might be aggregated and multiplied for greater effectiveness. So we're going to focus today on a small subset of our recommendations, some of the ones we consider most urgent and those which might be most surprising to you. And this is a little bit like picking your favorite child. We've really put a lot of thought and research into every recommendation in the report. And again, you can consult it for the full range. Um, and again, that link is posted in the chat. So we begin with two key recommendations, which involve thinking strategically about multiplier effect. Perhaps most urgent for companies is advocacy. It is key to build coalitions and common messaging to advocate for sustained investments from public and private resources. To expand advocacy and lobbying efforts at all levels, organizations of all types would do well to educate themselves about what activities are permitted to them instead of assuming that they're not allowed to advocate for themselves. The sector's unprecedented success in securing government support to weather the pandemic showed the importance of this work. And this is the moment to embark on more energetic advocacy and lobbying at the federal, state, and local level. And I'll just share anecdotally, anecdotically that we met with a very sympathetic state senator in California who had chaired a committee on the arts and were told by him that theater was not there to ask for resources the way that some other sectors are. Uh, that is a missed opportunity to capture resources that exist, but that are not being directed to theater or the arts more broadly. A key question, of course, is who has the capacity to do this advocacy work, this coalition building? And I know that we'll hear from Karina on how some of this is already happening, but I urge us to think about how it can be more effective and how the sector can best advocate for itself, again, at the national, state, and local level. Um, and for funders, the questions raised by the report are around thinking about the theater ecosystem as a whole, um, just funding individual artists and companies with changing funding priorities over time and mostly short term grants inhibits the sector's ability to plan for the longer term outside of constant crisis mode. This kind of thinking uh, in the longer term is necessary in order to make the changes that are being called for by audiences and creative workers alike. Uh, funders can help bring people to the table, can help develop models for public and private partnerships, help support more research into what is and is not working on a systems level, um, help fund service and advocacy organizations doing this work and doing some of the lobbying that uh, Barbara mentioned, and help support arts journalism that is helping to keep everyone um, in the industry in communication with each other about all of these developments. Um, funders can also be uh, conveners and enablers of new thinking about how arts and culture in the U.S. can make a case for itself on the uh, government and cultural level as well. Current conversations in the industry are looking at how the arts can become more involved in community building and various mental, physical, and social wellness initiatives. Um, funders can support the people and organizations who are innovating in these areas to allow them to develop pilot programs and models for wider sector level transformation. Thank you, Rhonda. So I want to turn now to two linked recommendations, which were some of the most surprising aspects of our research. These may not be on your radar every day, but we find that they're critical for thinking about resilience. They're for theater makers, but also for the funders and supporters who could help enable shared solutions. So the first um, that I want to speak about in these two linked ones is cl climate resilience. Um, we found that most of the thinking to date about how theater can help, um, that most of the thinking to date has been about how theater can help advocate for climate action or how companies' operations might be made more sustainable. Um, instead, we suggest theaters must face up to the fact that the climate crisis is here and impacting their work. Already in this moment, we need adaptation as well as advocacy. In summer 2022, uh, we found Michael Paulson, who covers the theater industry for the New York Times, um, was writing about the raging wildfires in California impeding the Oregon Shakespeare Festival and how climate change was impacting the beloved tradition of summer outdoor performance. By summer 2023, he was writing about how smoke from massive wildfires in Canada 
and forced Broadway theaters in New York City, some 400 miles away, to cancel performances. The saving grace was that some of those theaters had installed air filtration systems during COVID that were making it possible, barely, for the show to go on, assuming patrons were willing to brave the air outside to get there. In the past year, I have personally had the experience of canceled performances due to floods in Los Angeles and in New York. Unfortunately, none of those companies could call on alternate forms of delivery to salvage the performances. So our strong recommendation is that theaters confront the fact that the climate catastrophe will lead to canceled performances and other disruptions to business as usual. Companies need to build climate resilience and decarbonization into their current organizational models and their future goals. The time to prepare is now, whether by making contingency plans or purchasing a generator. Preparation also involves recognizing what we learned from the pandemic. Digital platforms and other forms of outreach offer a crucial lifeline one that would allow theaters to switch modes rather than entirely cancel performances. In addition to enabling performances in the event of a new health emergency, that is, streaming theater can also preserve vital access to culture and protect companies' livelihoods amid the climate catastrophe. And this leads me directly into discussing those digital platforms. In 2021, increasing audience accessibility was identified as one of the key ways to reimagine the industry in a survey of theater's essential workers. Yet despite claims during the pandemic that the accessibility of digital theater was a crucial advance, Zoom fatigue rules the day, and most theater makers emphasize their desire now to be back in a room with audiences, which we absolutely respect. Yet, so now we have very little streaming of existing productions, much less continued experimentation in the digital space. Unions have worked out limited agreements, at least for the Lord theaters, yet other obstacles remain, including worries about diluting the impact of in-person productions. And yet a commitment to streaming in quote unquote normal times, do we ever have those anymore, um, would help build relationships with audiences and access underserved communities while developing and maintaining a robust alternative to in-person performance for the next crisis. We see a role here for the NEA as a federal agency or for other funders to work on issues of access, whether geographic or for the disabled or other people who cannot make it to the theater. To reiterate, digital delivery systems are a key part of building resilience, not just in the face of another health emergency, but of climate catastrophe and other unknowns. So with that, I'm going to conclude our discussion of the report and just remind you once again that the link to the full text uh, and the full list of recommendations, as well as to the broader transnational report uh, has been posted um, in your chat. So moving on, I am truly beyond delighted to have with us today, Karina and Greg, both of whom were incredibly generous in speaking with us as we began our research pointing us to other people we needed to speak to, alerting us to what was going on. Um, they represent two key nodes of the theater ecosystem, uh, Theater Communications Group for Karina and uh, the NEA, of course, for Greg. So I'm going to start uh, with Karina, if I may, um, and turn to you now so we can hear from you on where some of this work to think strategically as a sector is already happening, where advocacy might be located, and anything else that you want to share with us. Thank you, Barbara and Rhonda. I'm very, very grateful for the invitation to speak with you all today. Um, and I'm grateful for the care that you've shown in crafting these recommendations. I very much admire the way you've met the complexity of this moment, um, these compounding crises, but also these opportunities. Um, hey, everybody, I'm Corinna Schulenberg. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm the Director of Communications and Research at uh, Theatre Communications Group. I'm joining you from the lands of the Muncie Lenape and the Canarsie uh, in what is colonially known as Forest Hills, Queens. Um, and if anyone needs a visual description, I am a middle-aged white trans woman uh, with glasses, kind of brownish strawberry blonde hair, and a sort of salmon-colored shirt um, sitting in front of my daughter's art, which includes a very realistic-looking donut. So <laughs> I, I really appreciate the invitation to name where some of the work is already happening. 
uh, because of course it is already happening. In many cases, it's been happening uh, before the pandemic. You know, looking over the the report and thinking about resiliency, I was thinking about, you know, this invitation of where to start the conversation about theater resiliency. You brought up the culture war of the of the you know nineties. I think you could even like trace it back to 1965, which was around the resident theater movement was really building up steam. Uh, and that was when these uh, academics, uh, Baumol and Bowen, published their analysis of cost disease, right? This idea that inflation would put increasing pressure on the live performing arts, since we can't take the same advantages of technology to scale. Um, although digital theater is one opportunity to address that. Um, but it's not a surprise that uh, after the pandemic and with rising inflation, that this um, that our theater ecology would be facing these pressures very intensely. Uh, I also think back if we started the conversation in 1939, when uh, Congress killed the federal theater project, <laughs> which I think is honestly the closest analogy we have to the impact of the pandemic, you know, just of a whole ecosystem kind of blinking off uh, overnight almost. Uh, and how that shifted our expectations on the levels of support we could expect from the federal government. Um, although I think we need to push back on those expectations. Uh, you know, we could honestly go back to um, the ships that brought over our colonial model of board governance, but I'm going to start more recently than that. <laughs> uh, and I really wanna focus in on these two recommendations about advocacy, because I do think that they are important in and of themselves and also in thinking about them, we can think about some of the ways we need to address the other recommendations. So for me, you know, I sort of lead with blessed are the organizers. And I mean organizer in the sort of grassroots sense, the people who have that energy to get people together, to make the connections, to say, look at the places where we have in common, and now let's build some power together. Sometimes that occurs within organizational frameworks like TCG. Very often it's grassroots, um, as with We See You White American Theater. And I think, you know, blessed are the organizers because organized demands are realized demands. Um, that is sort of my mantra from my other life, because I also do a lot of uh, political organizing outside of TCG. So it's my belief that uh, theaters and theater workers are only going to be fully resourced when we commit to advocacy as one part of building our collective power. So electoral power is an important part of collective power. Advocacy is an important part of electoral politics, but there is so much for us beyond those things. So just to give one example, at TCG's recent Theater for Activism Charge Up Gathering, we had this amazing conversation. Uh, Lori Baskin, our uh, amazing director of advocacy was there. She's been leading this work for so long, just wanna sing her name out. Uh, and we were also joined with a campaign director from the Working Families Party. This was really a fantastic conversation where we heard from the WFP how they conceptualize building power and advocacy is a part of that, but not the whole part, right? Because as powerful as arts advocacy can be, it begins after representatives have already been elected. So there are other models out there. Just to give one example, the League of Independent Theater, which is a 501c6 organization, uh, has endorsed candidates in New York City based on their art platforms. I know that Americans for the Arts used to have, maybe still does, an action fund uh, PAC, which has made donations to arts-friendly candidates. And during the uh, pandemic, our friends at the Professional Nonprofit Theater Coalition uh, worked and continue to work with Arnold and Porter, a lobbying firm, and Be an Arts Hero organized historic levels of freelance theater worker activism. All of these approaches are needed as we seek to build our collective power and make sure that no candidate would ever run for office without a compelling arts platform. But we're a long way from that. <laughs> you know, most of the time you don't see candidates with a strong arts platform. I think that we at TCG really wanna be a part of building that collective power. I'm gonna share a few ways in which we're gonna be doing that in the very near term. Um, and then I'm excited to hand it over to Greg. So one of the ways that we're doing it, of course, is through 
advocacy, which is still very important. It's still a core strength for TCG. Um, and we are joining with our friends from the Professional Nonprofit Theater Coalition next week in Washington, DC for the first ever Theater Week, uh, which is intended to hopefully be a recurring event where we can get the whole sector to show up and to advocate on Capitol Hill. Uh, and that we need everybody in that effort because we have a wide ranging set of needs. Organizations have specific needs that the federal government can meet. Individual, individual freelance workers have specific needs. One of the victories that you know we didn't mention so far during the pandemic was the expansion of unemployment benefits for gig workers. And there's still a lot of uh, laws that penalize gig workers who are very often, you know, theater workers are gig workers very often. So, you know, we need to be thinking holistically about what an arts issue is. It's not just funding for organizations, although it absolutely is funding for organizations. It's also visa issues. It's also funding arts education. You know, I recently read a report about a DACA recipient who is not able to continue performing in the, um, and the show that he's in right now uh, because of the backlog in the immigration system, to me, that's an arts issue, right? If, if, if performers can't do their work, it's an arts issue. Um, and I think what's really important about expanding that definition of what an arts issue is, is it is a place of strength and solidarity. You know, if we have time, I think we can talk about how a solidarity approach to advocacy links to a solidarity economy approach to building the overall resilience of our theater ecology. We could praise Sima Soweko for her amazing, talk about an organizer, organizing around building solidarity economy models. But I know I've only got 10 minutes before I got to hand it over to Greg. So I'm gonna to try to wrap this up. <laughs> but what I wanna say is I think when we have this uh, expensive view of uh, what advocacy is, what activism is, uh, it allows us to build relationships across a sector where we often have shared interests. And then our collective power, I think just becomes so strong. Um, and I am excited to be one of the organizers out of the hundreds, if not thousands in our theater ecology who are working to make that happen. Uh, and if you are, one of those uh, organizers, and you haven't already signed up to join us in DC next week, it is not too late. Please come on down. We're also gonna be talking about uh, governance in DC, which is absolutely connected to all of this. Um, our governance model is a huge part of whether or not the theater field will expand in its resilience. But I am looking at my little clock that I set myself and I see that I am almost out of time. And I believe in sharing time, I believe in sharing power. So I am thrilled to pass it over to Greg. Thank you, Karina. That's, um, you've left a, a lot of uh, tantalizing things to return to, um, which I think uh, we'll be able to do uh, in the Q&A section. Um, but yeah, so much to, to so much to think about. Uh, I really appreciate your, um, your contribution. Um, I'm going to turn now to Greg. And as we had discussed, I, I, I think what might be particularly valuable for our viewers would be to hear your sense of how the NEA can operate as a multiplier, can address the ecosystem, um, where it can engage other funders, as Rhonda was describing earlier, or help encourage them to consider new possibilities. And again, anything that you want to bring to the table. Great. Thank you, Barbara. And I will use my time, try to use my 10 minutes judiciously here because there's a few other things I want to talk about in addition to that question, which is super important and very top of mind for everyone at the Arts Endowment right now. But I just want to first say thank you, Karenna, for um, even though they tell you never follow a star when you're when you're presenting, I will do my best to follow you. <clears throat> and you brought up something, you know, I'm really thinking about the importance, as you spoke, Karenna, of PCG and of our service organizations across all artistic disciplines, not just theater, but in theater, we have such great ones. TCG, of course, um, the TYA USA Theater for Young Audiences. Um, and I'm actually here in Oklahoma City this week for the National Alliance of Music Theater Conference. Um, and these organizations are, you know, if not involved with them, they are 
learn about them, make, make it a point because they are the, the connectors for our field. We're, we're spread out all over this wonderful, huge country of ours. And these service organizations serve such an important function, particularly now. And I'm also just saying this pointedly because I understand that um, there are challenges service organizations have that, uh, that theaters don't in terms of fundraising. And I've, you know, some of our uh, fellow institutional funders are even pulling back their traditionally large support, which is very unfortunate in this moment. So for us at the NEA, support for service organizations is very important. We're committed to that support financially and in all the other ways that we support, whether it's showing up here in Oklahoma or I'll be with you, looking forward to seeing you in DC next week, Karina, Karina um, and in Chicago for the, the national conference in, in June. So I just wanted to say that so important. We're so lucky to have you as a, uh, in our field. Um, so I just want to briefly talk about some of the things we've seen as we're, and, and you and I talked about this, Barbara, um, uh, but some of the trends we're seeing and, and how we're trying to figure out ways that we can help uh, address these challenges. We've already talked about audiences not returning to pre-pandemic number. That's a big one. We've talked about how some of these trends with subscription models were declining before the pandemic and what are the new models. We're looking at a lot of new models. Um, arts journalism is a big piece of this. That uh, So we're working on a convening with the President of the arts, arts and Humanities uh, to bring together all sorts of different groups of theater makers and, and stakeholders. One of the most important groups, I think, are arts journalists, because if you don't have coverage of the arts, you don't know how, how do you even know, you know, how do audiences even know to show up? And I've even personally encountered performances that I missed locally in D.C., and it's sort of my job to know about this stuff. So if I'm not hearing it, what luck does anybody else have, have out there? Um, so I just across the country, especially in small markets, um, something happened in Wisconsin when my colleague was busy last year, um, where the local paper was bought out by a, a big um, a big hedge fund company. And the first thing they did was lay off all the local journalists, which include arts journalists. So the theaters were struggling to find ways to get the word out about their shows. Um, what just happened to my computer? Uh, we can see you fine. I, okay, I just, it, my my screen just went black. So, as long as you still hear me. Yes. Okay. Good. All right. So, um, next thing is eventization. This is a term that I heard when I was visiting Rhode Island, and and uh, was shared with me by Todd Trebor, who's the uh, acting deputy director of the Rhode Island State Arts Council on the Arts. This idea that everything has to be an event to get folks out. So, for your regular shows in your season, the the the, the wonderful new play small two character play. Uh, people wanna see the big show, something that, that gets them off the couch and into something in person. And that just puts huge pressure downstream on everything and the decisions that are made in programming. Um, so that that's a challenge. Working with schools is more challenging than ever. So many theaters are having trouble just, just reinvigorating the existing contacts they had with schools because of turnover um, and all the challenges of getting folks back to in-person learning. Um, <clears throat> some theaters in Los Angeles reporting that they started turning to libraries for partnerships after not being able to renew partnerships with local schools. Um, and, and just in general, the struggles of young people are facing is adding new dimensions and challenges to theaters engagement programs. So as theaters are taking on increasingly social service functions that were uh, met by other, other organizations in the past, just with the needs of their young people. Uh, one example, again, from Rhode Island that was shared was that there was a theater that was working with elementary school children and they discovered that the students didn't know how to use scissors. These were second graders. And that's just something we take for granted. That, but where would they have learned that? Except if they were, if, unless they were in person in kindergarten and first grade. Um, the cross sector, and this is something you were talking about, Barbara, the cross sector importance of arts and culture is becoming more broadly recognized. I'm gonna to get to that at the end in terms of how we're working on that. Um, Stepping is a huge challenge across the board, especially though technicians and fundraising professionals uh, so this is something we're thinking about. Are there ways to do apprenticeship programs that we can support paid apprenticeships? Um, and so look out for announcement um, that's going to be paired with our renewal of the Shakespeare and American Communities program that's coming out uh, in the next few months or so that's going to be specifically addressing the, um, the staffing challenges, the, the, the learning gap, the apprenticeships that, that we need in the field to get people in. Um, the high programming is a big deal. Uh, we talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, there are lots of challenges, both with, with costs and with technology and just with, with, with paying people, working with unions. But for some theaters, uh, when I was in Alaska, the Perseverance Theater really talked about how important it was for them because there's so many villages that are you can only get into from flying 
or by boat. And so to have the ability to connect, you know, some of these communities of, of folks like Klinglet el elders, where they where they don't have the ability to always for the in-person engagement, super important to keeping those connections alive. And then the last thing on my list was something that you talked about, Barbara, this climate change and disaster preparedness is just becoming a necessity. And we're looking at it all, all over the place. You know, Vermont, we had um, uh, theaters that were closed or had to cancel programming due to flooding. And, and I'm really happy that we have been able to be a little more nimble than maybe in the past with addressing those through emergency grants um, and just waiving things. Like if there was a deadline that was that night, but your internet was down because you had a flood, we'll, we'll find ways to extend that, which we normally wouldn't do. But if something has been declared a disaster area, that's now something that we are able to have flexibility in. Um, we're also partnering, I mentioned the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities, and we have a lot of exciting moments to partner with them that we've never had before that I'm really thrilled about. One of those is working with FEMA on specifically these issues and cultural preservation. Uh, we've been, our NEA teams have been down in Puerto Rico frequently over the last several years, working with them on their recovery and helping them, you know, apply for regular funding as well as emergency funding. Um, so those, so stay tuned for more about what's coming to happen with PCAH uh, and FEMA, but that's a big project. And as I mentioned, we're working with them on, how am I doing? Three minutes. Um, on our, uh, on our, we're working with them on a big convening that we're going to bring together folks from different sectors. That'll hopefully be happening later in August. In the lead up to that, we're going to be doing many listening sessions with stakeholders around groups around the country, just virtually. Um, so if you're on this, you may be hearing from me or one of my colleagues very soon to line you up to one of those listening sessions. Because we, one of the important things I feel like we can do as a federal agency, when you talked about, you know, modeling for federal, other institutional funders is that we're just here, we're listening, we're accessible. Um, our emails are, are and phone numbers are on our website. So you can call us at any time. There's no kind of, you know, process to reaching out, just email. And my email, I'll say it on, and you can share it later, is reinerdartsits.gov. Um, always happy to hear from folks in the field. And that's something that's very important to our fellow funders, just be talking to people and not just your usual clicks of folks that you already know. Um, and that's part of the joy of being out here in Oklahoma today uh, to meet, to actually see folks attending this NAMPT conference in person. Um, the last thing in the last two minutes is really to get to the heart of your original question. This cross, it's a really exciting time to be at the NEA with the cross sector work that's happening across all of government. We've, we've I've never seen this level of engagement from other parts of government before. We This committee that, that happened recently, the Arts Summit on Healing, Thriving, um, anyone anyway, going to need to pull this up so I get uh, healing, bridging, thriving, it's set on arts and culture in our communities. Uh, it's a mouthful, but they're all very important words to talk about what we were really trying to accomplish. So for example, the Surgeon General was there speaking about the loneliness epidemic in America and how important the arts are to connect folks and bring them together in person in a room to not feel lonely. The Health and Department of Health and Human Service was there. The Environmental Protection Agency was there. Um, so all these different federal agencies working together, because we're a tiny you know, agency in terms of the vastness of the federal government. But if we can be a catalyst and a gateway to address all of these challenges that you're talking about through the arts uh, and for us through theater specifically, but really all of the arts, uh, it's such an important tool in this moment, I think, as we um, come back together as, as a culture and a humanity and, and a, a nation uh, in post, I don't even know if this is the right word to use, forgive me for saying this, but moment. I know there's a better word term for that because it's still very much uh, alive and well, but in this moment of real. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you, Greg. I just, you know, it's so, it's so delicate to try to point out anything positive and what happened to us. And yet it does seem that among the very small bright spots are this kind of opening to thinking more broadly um, about the place of the of the arts in healing, right? The place of the arts in these in these processes that desperately need to occur now. Um, and so it, it seems to me very um, suggestive that you are finding this willingness to engage in those in those conversations uh, across government agencies now in a way that perhaps was not available before the pandemic, right? That it is in, in the wake of everything that occurred um, that people can recognize the centrality of the arts to those processes of healing and thriving. Yeah. 
Um, so thank you very much um, for those really uh, rich interventions. I think we're going to uh, open it up now for questions uh, from the audience. So again, feel free to put your questions in the group chat and Emily will relay them uh, to us. And so we'll be checking the chat uh, for those questions. Um, and maybe um, as uh, people get a chance to uh, post their questions um, on the chat, um, I might. Um, well, let me ask Rhonda, do you have anything that you want to put to our to our panelists since um, I thought I'd give you a chance to ask them anything you want to follow up? Yeah, my first um, question that I just noted down, um, thank you both for those uh, wonderful presentations and hearing about what's going on out there, which um, is very heartening from our side, of course. Um, I uh, My first question um, was for uh, Karina, but um, Greg, I think you said you're going to be there in DC as well. Just since we're on the West Coast and we're in LA, um, if we're not going to be in DC, uh, what are some things that we and sort of like the viewing audience can do? Like, what are some things that you think um, that the average person who, you know, is uh, interested in helping out the cause can uh, can do either with your organizations or just sort of in general that we could you know throw out some suggestions. Uh, I really love that question. Uh, certainly, we do have a hybrid option for some of the conversations that will be happening. So that's an immediate accessibility point for folks. But I think more broadly, you know, it is a kind of multi-step thing that you want to be doing, right? So first, you know, you want to be thinking in a local way about where your networks are, where your opportunity is to build the kind of community that is at the heart of all resilience, you know. Um, certainly from an advocacy perspective, there's always, um, I think people are often not fully aware of how many opportunities exist in municipal government to access support. Um, but even beyond the kind of advocacy framework, you know, when these climate disasters hit, you know, it is the local community that is the first responders to make sure that people are safe, that they have food and water. Uh, if the theater was impacted, that the theater can maybe find a new location in which to perform, you know. So even though TCG is a national service organization, you know, I, I think we're super clear on how critical that kind of local organizing is, you know. Um, and then I think, you know, through that lens of local organizing, plugging into where you feel your time can make the most difference. Certainly you should sign up for our, uh, our e-blast that will give you one click opportunities <laughs> to contact your representatives about important issues, you know. But more than that, you know, I think it's good to program your representatives, congressional, but also state and local, into your phone, get their numbers in there. I, I call mine on a regular basis, <laughs> you know, and very often you'll speak to people who will who will be a real person, and especially at the local and state level, will actually have answers for you when, when you call. Um, I think to the degree to which you can kind of get involved in any kind of um, electoral campaigning, if that's something you feel comfortable with, any kind of movement work um, that you can show up for. There, there are so many opportunities to do that. And as a theater person, you bring a really unique set of strengths uh, into that conversation. You know, it's always been so clear to me that whenever I, as a theater maker, come into a movement space or political organizing, they're like, oh my goodness, your skills <laughs> as a theater person are so needed, you know? Um, and I think that taking that kind of approach to building power at the local, state, and national level, you know, is, the, is how we're going to get through this. Building community at the local, state, and national level is gonna be how we're gonna get through this. And it's gonna look differently for everybody, you know, because we're, we're all so busy because of how capitalism functions. So we're not gonna be able to do all three of those necessarily. We're not all going to be able to be 
you know, super tapped in at the local, state, and national level. But if you can focus on one, you know, then then you know, if those of us at the state and national levels are doing well, if you're connected locally, you will be connected on some level at the national and state level. You know, so I think it does go back to that kind of, you know, blessed are the organizers and blessed are the organized, the people willing to show up, you know, put in the work to build power and to change the structures and systems so that they work for all of us. I think that's really interesting. One of the things that we um, found uh, was so complicated is as you move between these different levels, um, the organizations are different. Some might be geographically focused, right? They might be the arts in LA County, or they might, you know, imagine certain coalitions of the performing arts, but not others, right? They might carve up the arts in different ways. And so um, it, it seems incredibly challenging. I love hearing your optimism, <laughs> bless it, <laughs> organizers. Um, but, I, but I wonder also, um, you know, to what extent there are spaces for thinking about things like providing scripts, for theater people, scripts for addressing your local representatives, right? Scripts for bringing to to local government or state governments, right? So that so that there is, um, again, this kind of multiplier effect for the kind of you know good thinking about rationales for supporting the arts that might be occurring at the federal level. How do we get that you know out into as many communities as possible? Um, I'm also very mindful of what you said about. You know the impacts on on people's time and and one of the things that we found repeatedly is that you know it's not that theater makers don't know these things that we're pointing out they don't know that they need to focus on the audiences of the future they don't know that they need to think as a sector but everyone is operating um in conditions of scarcity and limited time and resources right so that's why i think and i sound so um i don't know economists but that's why i keep thinking about you know the efficiencies in offering people resources and offering people models or scripts so that they can do um, some of that some of that work. Um, I'm going to turn, unless you want to respond to any of that, Karina. Um, I'm going to turn to, um, there's a question in the chat uh, from Amanda who says, I would love to hear more specific numbers, if even possible, about subscription uh, audience findings from the post-pandemic seasons. And while we do have some numbers in our report, they are mostly from TCG's Theater Facts um, report. And so, uh, Karina, do you wanna say something to people about where they can find that kind of information and what sort of research goes into that invaluable report that you put out? Absolutely. So first, just want to thank our partners, SMU Data Arts, and uh, you name checked her earlier, but, you know, Dr. Zani Voss just being a, a long term, long time leader in providing this kind of longitudinal field wide data that is that is so critical. If you go to the TCG website, tcg.org, and you go to research and you go to theater facts, you will find a very robust study. <laughs> that goes into these questions about not just subscriptions, but also single ticket sales, working capital, you know, individual donor trends, trends at the, from funders, et cetera. You know, and what I'll say is that the, the sort of decline in subscriptions obviously predates the pandemic. Really, when you look back at um, older theater facts, you see, you know, in the, in the kind of 80s and 90s, this boom time when theaters were growing, the number of theaters were growing, and then, you know, right around the turn of the century, we start to see, we begin to see the declines in the subscription model. Um, there's the, of course, the, um, what happens after 2001 uh, and 9-11 and the, the sort of drop and rebound that happened there. And then in 2008, um, one thing that uh, Zani has said before is that there was scarring from 2008 that never healed. I think that's true. Um, and it was also around that time that social media really began taking off, leading to a host of consequences, including mental health declines for young people, which Greg brought up so beautifully. Um, but also I think to impacting how people um, connect with each other and with entertainment. Um, and then of course the pandemic. So the truth of the matter is the subscription question is really complicated. There are theaters that are still doing subscriptions really well that are even, you know, in small in a small number of cases, growing their subscriptions. 
Um, and a lot of theaters that are thinking really strategically about how to make subscriptions super flexible to meet people where they are, you know, which is very often it's difficult to plan far in advance. And, you know, that kind of foundational nature of the subscription model in the sustainability of the theaters, that decline is real, it's significant, um, and it's something that we're certainly grappling with at TCG. Um, and you can see more about that. The we go the theater facts on the website go way 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 back. So if you're curious and going down the rabbit hole like I like to do, <laughs> you can do that um, on the TCG website. And I'll just jump in and say that um, the the work that TCG does and that um, uh, Zanny Boss does in this respect is really critical. But we were struck by how little research there is on the sector in the US and especially you know what we were able to see because we were part of this transnational study um you know the way audience studies might be a research field for specialists you know in Canada <laughs> as was the case um uh in the research in that we were uh privy to um it i did have um some conversations with people who were involved in the graduate training um, of people in the field. And I think that's another key space in which we may want to think about, um, you know, are people being brought up who are training in arts administration to think broadly about the sector, uh, to think about these, these broader issues, right? Is that is that one of the places where we might get um, not just good information, but great ideas and innovation in the in the field, right? So that seems to me um, also key. Um, Rhonda, I think you wanted to address another of the questions that had come through in the chat. Uh, yes. So we had another question from Zoe in the chat um, that asks us to sort of consider why uh, theater may have been less active than other arts in advocacy historically. And uh, while that's, um, you know, sort of speculative on our part, um, I think we could probably uh, address a couple um angles on that, one being um, something that was especially clear to us in working in this transnational report is that we don't really have a like a national theater in the same way that like the UK does, for example, we don't and this was kept coming up, we don't really have like a ministry of culture necessarily in the same way either. So the pathways are, are less clear and a bit harder in, in some cases in, in the US system for sure. Um, and with theater, I think it's also, um, as we've been saying all along, sort of a confluence of a lot of different things coming together, you know, with uh, theater you need, in some cases, uh, a theater, you need a building, you need infrastructure and, and some things like that versus perhaps, you know, maybe less infrastructure for something like painting or, you know, something like that. Um, there's also just the collective nature of the endeavor. It's it's a, it's you know by definition sort of a, a lot of workers together, tech people, actors, directors, people doing the um, the administrative work and everything like that. And so there's um, sort of added challenges again uh, versus some things that are more like individual artistic endeavors in the sublime sense. Um, so, so there are challenges, but also I think um, it's, as we've been saying all along as well, and various people have brought up, is that it's, uh, it seems to be uh, that, that the industry, the theater industry is thinking about how to change their own self-conception in order to help, you know, change the conception in the broader culture of uh, the value of the arts, the value of theater and, you know, the performing arts to many different kinds of cultural life and, you know, health initiatives, as we've been talking about, um, the, the vitality of urban downtowns, um, bringing together, you know, um, citizens for messaging uh, around, you know, political issues or, you know, social issues and things like that. So there's a way of uh, trying very actively to get away from the idea of just the proscenium sitting in the dark very quietly, you know, with your expensive tickets and um, thinking about theater more broadly, even outside of, you know, the existing sort of theater building spaces as well as the place of theater in the culture um, more broadly. 
Yeah, and I think more anecdotally, I've seen some discussions even of how this almost sort of self-sacrificial ethos of the theater has heard it, right? The show must go on, we'll do whatever it takes. All of those um, ways of thinking about um, what people are up to when they make theater um, has not always, I think, allowed theater to ask for what it needs and what it and what it deserves, right, as, as part of a culture. Um, there's a question also about uh, what insights the transnational nature of the study provided and are there specific approaches or models in other countries that U.S. theater makers or government agencies could look to and so um, we can talk about that in the few minutes that we have left but I just actually was curious and I wanted to start by saying is there any bandwidth in what you do Greg or what you do Karina for looking outside the U.S. or you know just sort of thinking about our own really complicated landscape take up all of that space? I mean, well, I know you do a lot of international work, Brennan. Um, I'll say we have a small international division of folks who really are focused on that. From our perspective in theater, I mean, um, I'm, I'm certainly looking at what's happening over in other countries, um, particularly the UK, just because we're so close in terms of theater practice, but also internationally and beyond that. Um, and, and you know, they have, they have a whole different set of challenges, but I can't wait to read about that part of your report when the UK piece uh, comes out, you know, personally, I'm always wish I had the budget to just travel over. <laughs> There's so many shows in London I want to see right now. Um, but but it is something we think about around the globe in terms of artistic practice and, and traditions. Um, yeah, I, I can speak to that briefly because I know we're close on time, but I do just want to say that I think you know, it's not the full story to say that theater doesn't have a rich history of advocacy and, and activism. You know, I think about all the way stretching back to Free Southern Theater, which was considered sort of the arts arm of the civil rights movement, to El Teatro Campesino, you know, and putting literal lives on the line to make the art that would achieve the justice that they were looking for, to like, work that Greg has done before he got to the NEA that had a significant impact on policy. <laughs> You know, and it was in fact an, an, an astonishing act of collective action across the country. So I just want to say I think theater actually has a rich history of collective power, um, and it may be true that we don't always turn that to, and now support us with the resources that we deserve. <laughs> but that strength is there. And then I would just say that you know, um, from from TCG and the global angle, you know, we um, are one of the um, centers of the International Theater Institute. Um, we have a, a partnership called Global Theater Initiative. Amelia Cachapero and Big Kong Singh are two of the sort of heroes of getting out there into other countries and facilitating, you know, cross-border collaborations, which are which are incredibly vital. If we had more time, I would talk about them, but I will just pause to say if you're looking for more of that, um, just go to the international section of the TCG website and there's there's a lot of resources there that you can find. Yeah, thank you. And, and I'll just say quickly, um, we tried not to be too dispirited um, and instead be inspired by what we saw in other countries. Um, it is interesting to think about things like what it means to, you know, not have a ministry of culture um, and in terms of sort of centralizing efforts, right? So that the our colleagues in the UK were making recommendations for a future emergency about centralizing communications and centralizing response and so on, all of which would of course be wonderful in the US as well, but it's much more complicated to implement um, here. Um, and then, you know, there's a sense of, of the possible in terms of the support for the arts in those places and the givenness of the arguments about cultural value and the support for the arts that, again, I choose to think of as inspiring rather than dispiriting in the comparison. Greg, you wanted to say something as we wrap up? I would just point out, you know, because as, as we bemoan the, the different, you know, levels of funding in different countries, that there's another side of that, which is, I was just speaking to someone, a grantee who runs a theater uh, who that's touring internationally right now. And they were setting up a tour at a country um, that they were gonna be very much funded by that culture ministry and the government changed to a different government that did not favor uh, the kinds of work they were doing for political reasons. And so the whole festival was canceled, not just their project. So there are two sides of that where you know, when you're completely dependent on the federal subsidy, you are going to do what that government tells you. And I'm sure depending on what's no matter what side of the aisle you're on, you're on, you probably wouldn't like uh, whoever is in charge at any given time telling you what kind of art you can make. And so that's a, that's, a, I think, a positive for our country and our freedom of expression.
Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, thank you. Well, this has been an extraordinarily rich conversation. I only wish that we had more time, um, but I feel that we've covered um, a great deal. Again, I want to very much thank our panelists uh, for being here with us and for your thinking with us over this whole process. Uh, just once again to say, please go check out the whole report, check out the transnational report if you're interested, and uh, feel free to be in touch if you would like to follow up in any way from our conversation.